Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Taigo Premani Hare Hare Ho Okay, one more time Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Itai go permanandi Hare Hare wo Prabhupada ki jai. So um, I'm just going to remove the keyboard and then we'll begin. We're going to read where we left off, uh, unless there are some questions left over. There are, okay. Um, okay. And then we're going to read. All wrapped up in the holy name. The holy name is around my neck now. <clears throat> that will help me speak. Okay, so you want to post the questions? You have the questions? Okay, you're going to post them in the chat. Is that correct? All right. So from Krista, Sachid A. Sachi Nandan Maharaj gave an example that the other day, gave the gave example the other day of not improving our situation just because others are also struggling. He presented an analogy of a soldier riding a horse which suddenly dies of a heart attack, but the soldier keeps sitting on it. One neighbor also had a dead horse and blindly followed the soldier by sitting on it and going nowhere. When asked why wouldn't he change the horse, he said, look at this soldier. He is also sitting on a dead horse. Why shouldn't I? I'm not sure did I repeat it correctly, but I really like the idea behind it. Um, so this was... This was, um, I think, in relation. Was this in relation to being affected by? What was it in relation to, Christy? You remember being affected, or following bad examples, or being affected by the misbehavior of others? Do you remember? I don't remember. I think it was about being affected about the misbehavior, but it was two or three classes ago. Oh, okay, so yes. um, I, I want to turn it around. From, from our perspective out rather than from um, the way you're looking at it, because I think it's maybe more important. You know, a lot of times you can look at, um, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll just start here. When, so Christy's um, making the point that sometimes we're affected by what others do. But I want to turn it around and say others are affected by what you do. Because that, that sometimes gives you more impetus to change than just understanding that you yourself should change. But when you understand you affect other people, uh, that can be a greater impetus to change. Um, especially, and this may not be relevant to a lot of you yet, but as you age, as you grow, you will naturally have people who will look up to you 
whether you like it or not, it's just going to happen. I actually made a video this morning about it. And I've talked about this before. Um, you will become a senior devotee someday if you stay a devotee. It's obviously, you will become senior if you live long enough. And there will be younger people coming. And you all know that once you get over 30, for like a 20-year-old, you're like an antique. So, you know, they'll, and once you start getting like 40, then you're old enough to be their mother or father. So they're naturally going to see you that way. And it, I know it's awkward when, you know, especially if you're not married and someone calls you ma'am or sir, and you're only like 30 years old, but it does happen. I think in Texas, they call you ma'am or sir when you're like six years old. But in other places, um, you you will be respected as an elder. And there's a connotation that as an elder, you're more Krishna conscious. That's just a, a uh, you can't escape it, especially if you've been a devotee a long time, that that just, it, it would seem, but since you've been a devotee a long time, you're more Krishna conscious. And therefore what happens is what you do affects people more. They notice it more They say, well, you know, Pai's been a devotee for 40 years and she is eating pizza at midnight, so it must be okay, right? Maybe it's in some Shastra that I don't know about, or maybe it helps her get up early or something. And um, it, it's just part of a reality that when you, when you, um, get older, people notice what you're doing and it does affect them, right? Whether you like it or not, it's gonna happen. And, you know, like Alina is, you know, she's, she's introducing people to Krishna consciousness. So from their perspective, she's like self-realized already. They, you know, that's what every new person thinks of devotees. You've been a devotee three years, that's amazing. You must be self-realized. And Alina's thinking, no, I'm just, you know, I'm just Alina. But they're not thinking like that. And so whatever she does, it it has effect on them. Right, Alina? Yeah, it does. Believe me, it does. Especially when you start helping people become Krishna conscious, they notice, they notice what you're doing because they want to emulate it. It's just, you can't get around it, you know. You, if you're a teacher, then your students will assume you're an example of what you teach, and they'll notice what you do, you know. So, what, what we're discussing here is how the actions of one devotee affect the actions of another devotee. Um, if a very, very advanced devotee has a spiritual problem, it's common for all, not all, but it's common for your anarthas to start talking to you. And this is what they say. If he couldn't do it, how do you expect me to do it? Right? That's natural, you know. Some very, very advanced devotee has a problem, a very human problem maybe um, breaking one of the principles, for example. And, and we all know that following three principles is easy and following one principle is more difficult. Well, for some people, following two principles is more difficult. And if it's not a principle, it's something, either being humble or controlling your anger or not being envious, uh, whatever it is, right? Believing Krishna loves you, there's something. And so when some senior cracks, it, it can often put a crack in your own faith. Because I'm struggling with this, and even he couldn't do it. The opposite is also true. When, when a senior devotee says, you know, I've struggled all my life with this, but I stayed in Krishna consciousness, and I've been able to overcome it. Then you think, okay, there's hope on the horizon, right? But if he crashes, you think, well, you know, he was more advanced than I was. So what's the hope? What's my hope? Isn't it? So I just wanted to point out that although you don't realize it, even if you've been a devotee a year, 
when somebody new comes, you're old, you're old to them, you're a year ahead of them. And so they notice what you do and you do affect them, right? Um, I was just uh, making some videos this morning and I, I was saying that, you know, obviously sometimes we're criticized unjustly. We're unjustly criticized, but sometimes we may set up a situation, not set up, but sometimes we allow a situation to exist which is not wrong, but it lends itself to criticism. It lends, it lends itself to misunderstanding, right? So sometimes you have to be careful, right? Like when people want to take pictures with me, I always think, what are people going to think of this picture? You know, right, you know? Like especially, it's like we have three men here on Zoom, four men and eight women, right? So you say, well, let's take a picture. And I say, wait a minute. I know what some people are gonna think, you know. And you say, what are they gonna think? Actually, I don't know exactly what they're gonna think, but they could think so many things. You know, so probably nothing, but um, I always keep it in mind because of experience. Like it's just, I just don't want people to misunderstand. So that's part of being an example. You have to be a little conscious that you may not be doing anything that's wrong. It was like we have that story of Parvati was sitting on the lap of Lord Shiva. And of course we know Lord Shiva is not affected by this world. Neither is Parvati. But it could seem that way to the, uh, to the eyes of the ignorant. So I think Prabhupada said, maybe it wasn't so proper and public that he do that, I can't remember, but we could understand, you know. You have to be a little careful because people misunderstand. So it's, uh, it's a responsibility we all have, whether, <laughs> You want the responsibility or not, it's just a reality that younger people will look up to you. Your children will look and see what you're doing. Everybody looks at senior devotees. So, um, sometimes I think also there's some wisdom in not publicly demonstrating your weakness that it can be kept privately with your close friends that, you know, I feel like caving in in this situation, it's really difficult. But publicly, I have to be strong because I have to keep the faith of people. <clears throat> it's a really interesting, really interesting situation. Prabhupada was living in Los Angeles and I was fortunate to be living there also. And later on, I found out that during that time, there were some real problems in ISKCON that Prabhupada was, was facing, and he was very concerned that they could actually destroy the movement. And he was in a lot of anxiety. So even, even pure devotees will be in anxiety uh, about Krishna's movement. So the anxiety is transcendental, but the experience of anxiety, you know, anxiety, it's anxiety. It's stressful, it's difficult. And you know, I was there every day listening, hearing Prabhupada's class, you know, occasionally I had the good fortune of going on a morning walk or being in the garden with him. And there was nothing about him that indicated there was any anxiety. And I, you could just imagine if uh, Prabhupada exhibited anxiety and discouragement, how that would have affected us. I was like, if he can't deal with this. What about me? I thought he's a pure devotee. You know, where, where's this process going? doesn't work, you know. So I'm not saying that Prabhupada himself wasn't transcendental and unaffected, but I think at the same time, um, you know, as the Acharya, he has to set the example of, despite whatever is going on, being determined, being, um, you know, blissful during the kirtan, even though when the kirtan's over, you have to go back and face the problem and it's difficult like that. So I think that's important. Um, 
So then if we spin it around from the angle that Christie presented it, then you have another problem. Is everything that a senior does everything a senior devotee do, is everything they do right or good? And the answer is, it may be right for them and not right for you. That's also possible. So just because someone does it doesn't always mean that's what you should do. And so that's, that's sometimes a difficult decision, but I just wanted to throw it out there that, you know, because we're all different. So I mean, I've, some things are obvious, right? So-and-so sleeps four hours, you can't do that. <clears throat> So-and-so takes a huge responsibility you can't do, but other things you may consider, is this the right thing for me? It's the right thing, but is it the right thing for me? So there are two, two things, the right thing and the right thing for me are two different things, right? Maybe the right thing for you next year or in 10 years or 50 years, but not right now. Um, then we have a bigger problem, and this it's, is harder to ascertain, but sometimes Prabhupada wanted us not to do certain things or to do certain things, and most devotees don't know, and only some know. So a senior who doesn't know may improperly behave or do something wrong. And, and if sometimes you question or you feel maybe it's not right, you can you know, discuss with that person or with uh, another senior uh, in a humble way. Humble is the key word. If you're humble, and if you're not humble, I don't know what you're going to do then. You're going to discuss it in a non-humble way, and you're going to get yourself in trouble. Okay, Bhakti Lata says, all judgment and prejudice comes from the mind. Well, actually it comes from the heart and then the mind processes, processes, processes it. Despite the fact that others may think about our actions and express us criticism, should we be fixated on our consciousness and not on what others may think of us? The answer is generally yes, but I wouldn't say no across the board because what they're saying may be true. <clears throat> so I can just relate to you my experience um, that it's always, it's always good to be open to what people are saying because that way you can improve your service or improve yourself. But when people are making criticisms that aren't valuable or people are making, did you hear a voice? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Anyway, when people are making, there's a lady in my office, did you hear? Did you hear that voice? That mean, did you hear that voice? The recording, that means I'm alone with a woman in my office, right? Is that what it means? Yeah. So when somebody says, I heard a voice in Mahatma's office, he's alone with another woman, and she sounded like a young woman, and she sounded like she's very beautiful, then yeah, obviously, why would you want to worry about that? And, you know, have to write a long essay that was actually just the voice on Zoom and explain it, you know, spend three hours explaining that. No, it's not worth it. So some criticism, when you hear it, you can kind of understand that it's a person who has some trauma in their life or some triggers or something. And so they're, ex they're very sensitive to devotees acting in certain ways or leaders doing or saying certain things. You can take that, you can take that and understand it and say, okay, I understand there are people who are sensitive and I have to be sensitive. Um, but factually, a lot of times when this happens, you really didn't do anything wrong. It was just wrong for that person or those types of people. So, you know, we, you still want to take that into consideration, but not have nightmares over it or, you know, cry the rest of the day. So that happens, right? And maybe it's good advice. So you need to be more sensitive, you know, 
you didn't say anything wrong, you didn't do anything wrong, but there are people who are sensitive to that, right? Like you, you know, you said, and this, and this black person came to the temple, and someone sensitive is that you shouldn't say black, you should say Afro American, or you should say something else. Like okay, but you, you didn't have any ill feelings towards that person at all. Well, that's not what you meant. But it's like you take okay, some people are sensitive to that. I need to be sensitive. That's a good point. So you can take it, but not like feel. Is there something wrong with me? Do I really? Do I really not like black people? No, that's not. That's not who you are. You know you you're not like that. But if you are like that, you can maybe I do not like black people. That's maybe why I said it. It's up, it's up to you. You can take it that way and say, okay. Maybe I need to be more sensitive, or maybe there's just people who are sensitive that I need to be aware of. Right? Then there's feedback that you'll get, which is actually good. So if you're if your inclination is to think, oh, they're just envious, then you you will shut down, right? You won't listen. So rather than make an assumption, they're just envious or they just don't like senior Prabhupada disciples because Prabhupada disciples think they're entitled to, you know, all the Maha Prasadam or whatever. First in line, Maha. They just come and take over the temple when they get there. So if, if they're not coming from that place, then you know, obviously you want to listen and say, well, let me consider what they're saying. Maybe there's something value. I don't want to make a blanket judgment that everyone who criticizes me is envious because they're not. Some people are good intentioned, but they don't know how to communicate well. So it just doesn't come out well. Why do you do this? Why do you, blah, blah, blah? you know, but actually what they're saying behind it is I, I want to see Prabhupada's movement better. I want to see our leaders better, but it just doesn't come out that way. So if your natural response is defense and to call anyone who criticizes you in a way which isn't gentle, envious, that's not good because we need to be open. We need to be, as a leader, especially you need to be willing. We all need to be willing at least to listen to people. Now, if, if it's a person who, you know, if you turn right, they'll criticize you. Why did you turn right? And if you turn left, they'll criticize you. Why did you turn left? then, you know, it's a lose-lose situation and you don't want to lose sleep over that because it becomes obvious with some criticism, it's, a, it's the personal problem of that person. They're, they're, you know, you're a leader and they don't like authority for whatever reason, or maybe they were in, in the military and, you know, traumatized by their sergeant and, you know, like anyone in a position of authority is like they don't like, or they were just hippies. Hippies don't like authorities. Or they're just like Brahmins, anarchistic Brahmins, you know, we do what we want, when we want, how we want, nobody's going to tell us. We read the Shastra and we act. There may be so many reasons. Um, and you know those people when you meet them, because, and they're predictable. And you know, you're going to say something and you know what they're going to say, right? And so that's, that's who they are. Now, to get overly upset about the criticism of those people or to consider it seriously, that you have to decide how much credence you want to give. I mean, they may say something that's valuable, that's possible, but often they're just mad and angry and and it can be because it can discourage you in your bhakti. Am I, you know, because you may not be the way they're saying you are. Um, there's a third class, well, maybe, maybe we're up to the fourth kind of person. There's the fourth kind of person who makes criticism based on hearsay and assumption, right? Like you were a guru in 1978. That means you were a zonal acharya. That means you're bad, right? Well, is that true logically? I don't think so. You know, I... No god brothers who were zonal charis who didn't want to be. They fought it and the GBC forced them. Did you know that? I know gurus who didn't want to be zonal charis and all the temple presidents in their zone forced them because they said, if you don't start initiating, then Gaudiya Math is going to come in and initiate all our devotees. So they did it. So you know you're you're making assumptions. Zonal acharyas are bad. So you know, you are zonal charya, I don't like you. 
So, you know, if, if that's the kind of criticism that we're going to get, um, you know, we have to put it in a compartment and um, understand. Okay, I understand why people think that way. Other zonal charyas, they did create problems. But to make an assumption that they're all the same and they all did the same thing, that's unfair. So I think you women, you don't have to be zonal charyas to experience this. Well, you're a woman, therefore, blank, 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 blank. So, you know, you, isn't it? Or you're a, you're a French, therefore, blank, blank, blank. Or you're American, therefore, blank, blank. You're Mexican, therefore, blank, blank, blank. So, uh, welcome to the material world. You will be judged uh, unfairly. There's no justice in the, in the court of, what's this, the court of human interaction. There's not always, not no justice. There's not always justice in the court of human interaction. People will, will become the judge and jury and they'll convict you. Well, you know, we know that Mexican women are like this, right? They'll just be judged. This is how they are. Right? You have that experience? Or Sujan, he's a young Indian. So, you know, I'm an American. I have an idea of what well, I know better now because I'm a devotee, but Americans may have ideas of what Indians are. They're all IT geeks, basically, because the only practically 90% of the Indians in America are, you know, writing software or finding bugs in software. That's what they do. So it is natural to stereotype them, you know, and most of them are not married. So, and they're sending all their money back to their mother and father, you know, so I will profile you, Shujan, as an IT geek who gets a job in America and sends money back to his mother because you're controlled by your mother, right? Did I profile you well? Yeah. Who likes a lot of Western things because he didn't, because his parents wouldn't let them let him do them when he was young, so now as an adult, he's doing them there. I think that's the profile, right? And some of those things he's doing, they're not good. Shouldn't be doing and he, if he comes to America, he may do some things even Americans don't like doing because it's new for him and old for us. So now I've got him profiled, right? So, um, so we all have to deal with this. And, and I, you know, I, always, I think it's good. It's helpful if we're criticized to understand why people may criticize. So, so those of you who don't know Zonal Charya, these were the people who first became gurus and they were GBC. So everyone in their zones became their disciple. It was like, you know, you didn't really have a choice. You kind of did, but it was frowned upon. So it was like little, they had a little kingdom in their part of the world. And so let's say you were a devotee at that time. And, and you saw the problems of that. You know, the devotees weren't allowed to choose their guru. And if the God brothers didn't support the guru, he thought they were envious and it created problems. So let's say you were actually thrown out of that zone because you didn't like the zonal charya system. So it's understandable that if someone was a zonal, char zonal acharya, you may not like him, right? It's understandable. You know, if you, if you were abused by a certain ethnic race, it's understandable you would be afraid of those people or you would stereotype them as criminals or whatever, right? Isn't it? So would you like to be in a dark alley at midnight with a Mexican man walking down there? I don't think so. I don't think Honorada would be either and she's Mexican. So she she's going to profile them as well. So um, especially if she were attacked uh, by one in the past. Yeah, of course, it's natural. So it's good for us to understand why people may profile us. It's not that necessarily we did anything wrong or they have anything against us. It's just maybe they have had a bad experience, right? So it's good to know that, right? And um, the other thing is, it's important to understand is that I'll use the example of sunglasses. Imagine sunglasses of varying, varying colors. You've probably seen yellow ones, rose color ones, of course, the normal color ones, blue. I had a pair of blue. It was, it was for a, 
teaching. I put them on to teach because I put them on. I go, oh, everything's blue. So beautiful. And everyone's saying, no, it's not blue. I go, what do you mean? It's everything's blue. So some people have blue glasses. Some have the rosy glasses. Some have the dark color glasses. Some have no glass, no color. Some have yellow. And so it's good to understand that when people tell you things that don't make sense to you, that they're seeing things through a certain perspective. So it makes sense to them. Right now, there's an issue in ISKCON. And there's two sides to the issue. And it's very easy, at least for me, to understand why there's two sides, because they're coming from two different color glasses very different. And so when you look through this color glass, the obvious answer is this. And when you look from this color glass, the obvious answer is this. And they're both logically obvious if you look through that lens. But if you don't look through that lens, you cannot understand why anybody wouldn't understand you, right? So, so it, it's good, even if you're being criticized, to just think, well, what lens are they looking through? Is there any value to that lens? And when you understand the lens, it may make sense. Now, one lens is they're just crazy and envious. I, I, I don't want to deny that lens. That lens does exist. But often they're not crazy and envious. They're just, they have a lens of concern about you as a leader or concern about Prabhupada's movement. And, and so uh, that helps us listen. And then once you listen, you have to decide, is this valuable or not? Are they just, you know, are they just going to criticize if I go right or left? We have that story. Not all of you have heard this story. It's a classic story to illustrate this. It's such a good story. So there's a grandfather his grandson and a donkey, and they're traveling with some, I guess, goods that the donkey, no, no, they're just traveling with the donkey. So the grandson says, well, grandfather, you get on the donkey. So they're going through the village and everybody's criticizing the grandfather. Why are you allowing your grandson to walk while you ride? He's just a young boy. So they think about it. So they get off and everyone's okay. Then they go in the next village and the people are stopping the young boy and say, this is an old man and you're right and you're a young boy. You can walk. Why are you allowing your grandfather? Why are you forcing your grandfather to walk? And so now they're thinking, okay, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So then they, they think, okay, We'll just both get on the donkey. And they think, well, that'll solve the problem. So they go in the next village and people are saying, this poor donkey, why are you both on the donkey? It's so much weight. Why don't one of you get off? Right. So they're thinking, okay. So <laughs> the next village, <laughs> the next village, they walk the donkey. And the people are saying, you idiots, why you, you have a donkey. Why don't you get on the donkey and ride while you're walking, right? So, I mean, what could be a better story than that? That's so classic, isn't it? So that's the nature of envy, right? So, you know, now, if you were that young man and grandfather, I think after the end, you would have some realization like, yeah, I don't think we should really worry about what other people think because there's always going to be somebody who doesn't like what we do. I think we were talking about that yesterday or Friday or last Wednesday, that no matter how popular a movie is or a song or a YouTube video is, there are always people who don't like it, right? I bet there are people on this planet who don't like mangoes and maybe you're among them. Right? And Prabhupada said, mango is the king of fruit. And so let's say Alina says, I don't like mangoes. And I think, you don't like mangoes. What is wrong with you? How could you not like mangoes? Like what planet are you from? Like all these, isn't, isn't it? You ever, do you ever have that experience when someone says they didn't like something? 
And you just like, you can't believe they said that. You didn't say that, did you? I didn't hear that correctly, did I? So, yeah. So there, there will always be people who don't like what you do. And it doesn't matter what you do because they won't like it. If it's right, they won't like it. And if it's left, why? Because they don't like you. <laughs> okay, well, one solution is you could commit suicide. That would solve the problem, right? At least for a while. <laughs> so what to do, right? So um, there's a balance there between being able to listen to feedback and then also understanding when that feedback is... Uh, it's never going to end, no matter what you do. I'll, I'll end it with a little um, icing on the cake here. There was a devotee. He, he was labeled, and he labeled himself the black sheep of Iskon. So he, I was told he once said, and knowing him, I could believe he would say this. He said, whatever way Iskon goes, I will go the other way. And if I go the other way and they come that way, then I will go the other way. I will always oppose because it's my nature. So I thought that was an honest statement and, and, reveal, and it reveals that there are people like that. They will never go along. It's against their nature to go along. They, no matter what direction you go, they'll criticize it. Like the, like the donkey and the grandfather and the grandson. So Pi has his statement or a question if a person knows that something might not be the right thing to do but suffer from mental health problems or addiction therefore is kind of limited in their own growth and decision making how do we support them to still make the right decision um, by talk by letting them talk about it because if they talk about it um, they'll probably get clear at least that's one way um, ask them what is the best thing what do you think will have the best result? Take care of yourself. Be self-compassionate. Do what's best. Sometimes trying too hard and failing one time after the other seems to make people much more fallen. So how do we help them um, getting better without being hard on themselves? Well, there's two things you can do that come to mind that I've used. One is redefine failure and success because maybe with a redefinition, it would be better. Um, you know, we say change the goalpost, right? Goalpost is too far. Um, and reassure them that everyone fails and part of the process of becoming perfect is failing. Not to use as an excuse, of course, but and to use as an encouragement. I think some people are very hard on themselves. Uh, often, because their parents were hard on them, so they adopted the same mentality. Or, or sometimes their parents weren't hard on them, their parents were just encouraging them, oh, you can do better. And they interpreted it in a way that, you know, I have to be perfect. And I think some people are born with that. They have that some score, you know, everything has to be perfect, which uh, I feel sorry for them because until they go back to Godhead, that mentality is not going to work for them down here anyway. And, you know, trying to make everything perfect in the material world, that's like, that's really difficult. Oh, no, 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 I've got a wrinkle in my corta. I can't wear it. You know, it's like, and then you iron it and you sit down and you have like 76 wrinkles on your rear end. So, so you know, like, what are you going to do? You know, we can make a comedy routine. There, there actually was a show like that in America called Mr. Monk. And he was this eccentric fanatic. Everything had to be clean and you know, everything he touched, he would wipe off and you know everything had to be perfect. Um, I'm asking because I am working with these people all the time as a coach. Sometimes it's difficult to know how much responsibility I should give people. Getting too many roles you can't live up to might make people feel worse, yes, because of guilt and shame. Um, well, as a coach, you know, sometimes you just have to ask questions and let them figure it out. You ask the right questions. How does this make you feel? I think there's a different way to look at this. I mean, you know, 
the classic question, which has so much power is, okay, I just did this and I failed. The classic question is, well, could you give it a different meaning than failure? How else could you, what, what else could it mean? And I did some work with a Buddhist teacher, um, which maybe is a little dangerous. I didn't know it was Buddhist, but I learned something which is good for psychology. Maybe not, maybe not actually our Siddhanta, but um, it's interesting because something philosophical may not work on a psychological level. So on the psychological level, we did an exercise in which we would look at things. Instead of naming them, we would give them numbers. Or we give them names that didn't mean anything, you know. So you see something. What do you call that? I'll call, call that code one. What was it? It was just a chair. Call it code one. And so, you know, um, and, and what about this person who hates you? I'll call them, you know, I'll, call, I'll give it a name that has nothing to do with them hating me. I'll call them uh, red lollipop, right? So you, so, you know, so you could do that in your coaching. So just give it a different name, you know, a name without judgment. So the whole idea is, you know, in Buddhism, I mean, it's also there in Bhagavad Gita, maybe more so in Buddhism. The, the idea is see it without judging it, without labeling, because the label puts you in duality. So if you want to get beyond duality, don't label it. It's just, just see it as it, it just is. What is that? It's a chair. Not a good chair, a bad chair. It's just a chair. Of course, we know it's a bad chair, because if you sit in it, you're going to fall off the chair. So we, but from, from another platform, it's a chair. It's just we, you know, every everything in the material world's bad. So you know, call it good as false, call it bad as false. It's just there's a verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita like that. But but as a you know, as soon as you start calling things good and bad, you get caught up in duality. Of course, for practical affairs, you have to discriminate. But in in this area, that kind of discrimination could destroy you. I am bad. What I did is bad. All right. Was it actually bad? Are you actually bad? Or is that just the label you're putting on yourself? Okay, let's put another label on it. Okay, what did you do? Give it another label. I'll call it red lollipop. Okay, how does that make you feel? Oh, fine. There's no connotation to red lollipop. Actually, it makes me feel good. I like red lollipops. So sometimes, sometimes things are not good or bad. They just are. Yeah, it's just like, you know, my car broke down. Is that bad? Yeah, but it, it is. It just is, you know, like, well, is it bad? If, well, it's bad if I, you know, start screaming, I guess. But if I don't scream and I just, you know, call up the towing company, it just is. It's just, that's what it is. Right? Okay, I'm going to be late for work. Okay, that's just what it is. <laughs> As we say in America, it is what it is. So sometimes you just, it just has to be, it is what it is. And, and when we're criticized, sometimes, well, it just is what it is. You know, it's the nature of the world. If you, I have a really good suggestion for all of you. You may want to take suggestion up. None of us like to be criticized, that's for sure. And since we don't like to be criticized, I have a suggestion how we could avoid it. And um, not a bad suggestion, I think. Go back to Godhead, because there you won't be criticized. That will solve it. Um, you could decide if you want to take that suggestion up or not. That, that's up to you. But um, it's always what I fall back on when, when we look at the nature of the modes of nature and how um, actions in this world often torment, torment us. I always think, well, at least when I go back to Godhead, I'm not going to have that problem anymore. So this is kind of an impetus, you know, like, like here, it doesn't like really seem that everyone's going to love one another, you know, even the people chanting Hare Krishna, sometimes they don't like one another. So, you know, I don't know what hope there is for those who aren't chanting. So that's kind of an impetus to go back to Godhead, isn't it? What do you think? Yeah. And Matthew, I'm happy to let you know that when you go back to Godhead, you don't have to work. So that'll be a relief, right? You run it. You retire as soon as you get there. 
retirement begins upon entrance. So that's good to know. And you have a pension. As soon as you get there, you get a pension. And how does that pension work? Whatever you want, you get. How do you get it? Just think about it. And there it is. Sound good? I think so. Sounds good to me. Christy says, skip her comments, save time. Tanya says, exactly what P mentioned, there are devotees who have been in KC for a long time and transcendentally, they have deep realizations, but they also have deep psychological problems, <laughs> cause all kinds of problems in the community. They act inappropriately towards younger Mataji's or have outbursts of aggressive behavior to mention just a few instances. Well, the, the problem with that is sometimes it's not so obvious. Or sometimes when I think, well, that Prabhu was really transcendental. You know, his accent, accent, what's the word? Eccentricism. Is that a word? Eccentricism. If it isn't, it is now. Call up Webster's Dictionary and tell them to put that word in the dictionary if it's not there. Um, his, his eccentricism is a sign of his transcendence. And it could be, but it may not be. So we have to discriminate, you know, if, if his anger is transcendental or it's triggered by something other than Krishna consciousness. Um, because if it's Krishna conscious, then we should be affected, but, you know, we should hear what he's saying and we should understand why is he so angry at me? Because I must have really done something wrong. But if it's not Krishna conscious, then I shouldn't think I've done something wrong, but rather he's triggered by something. And if we don't make the discrimination, it can be a real problem for us because then we think, God, I've really done something wrong when in fact you didn't. It was him. So this is sometimes difficult because you don't want to make offenses and you want to be respectful, but you also have to save yourself. So you don't get discouraged or depressed for having done something which was not wrong in the first place, right? So I don't have an easy formula, but I think sometimes you just, you, you know what Krishna consciousness is. And if something doesn't look like it's Krishna consciousness, it probably isn't. <laughs> I don't know how to say it any other way, you know. Looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck. It probably is, you know. So if someone is, you know, quacking like, you know, something that's not Krishna conscious, it probably isn't. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the point is that um, if something, if someone is acting in a way that's not Krishna conscious, then you may have to respectfully distance yourself and not to not be affected by it. And just understand that that person is going through whatever he's going through. So what Tanya said is it's like super, super, super important uh, to discuss. I'm going to discuss it a little more. There, is, there can be an assumption that every problem on every level will go away by being Krishna conscious. And of course, the answer is, well, how Krishna conscious does it have to be before it goes away? And the answer is, well, it depends on what you're needing to heal. And, you know, deeper conditioning will require more Krishna consciousness. And there's also the question, well, will, will deep psychological scars go away by being Krishna conscious? And the answer is definitely maybe, but, but, if I were to do data-based research, I would say some do and some need other work. Some actually have to, you know, like you have an anger issue. Okay, you know, get up, sadhana, chant, all these things. But if you're still dealing with it, then um, you may have to, to focus on it and understand it more deeply. So there's a man, I don't know what his name is, John Wellness or something, something wellness who coined a term, term 
spiritual bypassing. And, and he was a Buddhist monk, and he observed this amongst the Buddhists, that they have their human side. And we all know our human side because we deal with it uh, at every moment. So we know that even though we're devotees, we're still humans. We sometimes become angry or envious or are affected by our environment or attracted to things we shouldn't be attracted to, etc. And we also have deep conditioning from this life and other lives. And some people have been through very, very difficult lives, very difficult childhood, childhoods. And difficult childhoods have huge effects, huge effects, or not always huge, but they definitely have effects. And so he was saying he he's seen people who have come, you know, to the Buddhist path with very difficult backgrounds. And those backgrounds did not get healed because they thought by chanting their mantras and doing their sadhana and seva, it all would be healed. And so he turned that spiritual bypass. It's like you're here's the problem you need to deal with, and you just take your mantra around it and the problem stays. Does that make sense? Bypass. Oh, here. See my hand. My hand is the problem. So Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. But the problem is still there, right? In some cases, the problem goes away, but it's some these deeply, you know, deeply conditioned experiences, you know, like if someone's sexually abused, they have to deal with that because that can destroy their whole life, you know, if they're abused as a child, if they don't deal with it. So I, I, I don't want to say that people who chant Hare Krishna haven't overcome trauma. It's just that there are those who haven't, and there's a lot of them. So he used that term spiritual bypass. To avoid dealing with your issues by thinking, if I just take to the spiritual process, it, it will work. And so he said what he saw happening was that people didn't realize they had the issues because they, they kind of transcended them. They didn't feel really bothered by them. And that's true. When you if you actually transcend, you won't be. But he was saying it was more of a thinking that they transcended, but they actually hadn't. And so his whole point was that even though we're spiritual practitioners, we're also human beings. We have that, obviously. You have a body and a mind, and you have a soul. So we're doing practices which are purifying the soul. But it... it you also have to take care of your body and mind. And so he said a lot of people came to Buddhism to use it as an escape for their problems. He said it attracted, lots of people are attracted to spiritual life. So, so they naturally go into spiritual bypass because that's why they came, to deal with their problem by not dealing with it, by just moving in the ashram or chanting. Which is really an interesting point, isn't it? Because it exacerbates the problem it's like now they're in the environment which will exacerbate the problem. What's the problem? Suppression, repression, neglect, not admitting that the problem is there or admitting it, but not thinking you have to deal with it. So he said spiritual, the spiritual path often attracts people who want to avoid acknowledging their problems or want to solve their problems by avoiding them. It's interesting, isn't it? No, it's really interesting. So the point Tanya is making is that if we see someone who's very advanced, but at the same time is very human, um, is normal to some degree. We, we wish our leaders wouldn't be human. If they, could, if they could take a pill and not be human, that would be better. And they're becoming less and less human, quote unquote, more transcendental as they advance but we're all on different levels. And so if you see a, a leader is human and you think it, it's transcendental, that could be problematic for you and for him, right? Because um, then you start to yell and scream at everybody thinking, well, it's transcendental because my leader does it, right? Actually, I practice every night screaming because you know that's what you do when you're a leader, you scream at everybody. Well, that's what he does. And you think that sounds funny, but it's actually true. That's how it works, isn't it? Hare Krishna. I have to write a book on this stuff. It's so interesting. Can one of you come here and 
do everything I do, and so I can go hide and write the book. Or maybe I do one of the, you know, I was thinking I could do a mystic yoga and, and expand myself into eight, but eight people do the same thing, which is okay if you're like washed painting your house because there's eight of you. But, you know, it basically has to be the same thing. So, you know, eight people answering the same email. I don't know like how that works. You know, I don't know exactly how it works. Maybe they can answer eight, e eight emails. Well, that would work. Yeah. Okay. So I'll spend the next 20 years learning this mystic yoga. And so that in 20 years, my life will be easier. But for the next 20, you won't see me. Uh, probably not a good idea. Right? Uh, Christy says, we bring all our luggage with us to ISKCON. I also deeply feel understanding psychology is vital for a functioning community. Yeah. You know, like people people say, is, is psychology important? Or I don't think psychology is important. To me, it's like kind of saying like health is not important. It's just mental health, you know. I mean, like the whole process of yoga is dealing with the mind, you know. So if you're not good at dealing with your mind and emotions, then it's going to be difficult. And I think some people say that because it's a spiritual bypass, because the spiritual process, why do we need anything else? Because it'll all, yeah, in many cases, you don't. I mean, so many people were addicted to drugs and they just became devotees, moved in the ashram. That was it. But they weren't heroin addicts. They were addicted to marijuana and hashish, psilocybin, LSD, which is different. It's not a physical thing. Okay, addicted to coffee, tea. That's not so hard to get over. But um, still, we have people who are devotees, 16 rounders, Mongol arti goers who have addictions. Did you know that? Yeah, well, now you know if you didn't. Yeah, who still have addictions they can't give up. And I'm not talking about to potato chips, something more serious than that, or to Mongol, Mongol arti sweets. Those Mongol arti sweet addiction, not bad but addicted to other things. So it shows that sometimes these scars are very deep and they need we need to work on them. So if a leader is misbehaving and you don't know it, it's a problem, it's, it can be a huge problem for you for many reasons, because you would allow that person to abuse you or you would think that's what I'm gonna do when I'm a leader, I'll abuse other people because that's transcendental, right? So thank you for bringing that up, um, Tanya. Tanya, are you a psychologist? If not, you, you are? Yeah, so that's why she said that. Oh, I should send you, I, I sent some of you this thing on spiritual bypass. You know about spiritual bypassing, Tanya? Have you read about it? You, you, what? you um, yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because, or like Pi, um, if you're a coach and counseling, um, if you stay, in Krishna consciousness, you will end up counseling devotees because it's it's a need. A lot of devotees need counseling by people who are trained as coaches and therapists. And um, so you will see, you will have to deal with the spiritual bypass issue because it's quite common. Understandably common because our Shastra says all good qualities will develop when you become a pure devotee, when, whenever that is. And, um, but I wouldn't say that the Maha Mantra is meant meant to cure certain traumas in life that it you know it can inadvertently by changing your consciousness in a way that would heal those but sometimes we have to help people change their consciousness to be able to heal those and a lot of people are you know have been traumatized when their kids are still eight years old in consciousness i mean we, you know the therapy brings them to adulthood to now because as adults they can deal with it but as kids they can't so the trauma can keep you in the same mood and attitudes and beliefs as you had when you were a child. Um, and all the guilt and shame that a child has when a child is abused because they think, well, there's something wrong with me because why would an adult abuse me unless there's something wrong with me, which is normal for a child. And then they isolate to protect themselves. So you have adults who isolate and they don't know why. And then you go back and you find out why. I had a brahmachari that I was helping, and he was very isolated in the ashram. He didn't know why. He was in a foster home. We figured it out. He said in the foster home, and he was being physically abused by the other boys. 
And so he isolated. So that's what he did when he came in the ashram. Makes sense, right? So he's going to Mangal Artik every day. He's chanting Hare Krishna every day. He's preaching every day. He's studying everything. And he's still isolating because that's his, he hasn't, he hasn't been healed. He hasn't, he, he, he doesn't know that's why. And he hasn't been, he hasn't dealt with someone who could help him heal that trauma so that he doesn't have to fear the other brahmacharis like he feared those people in the foster home. It's interesting, isn't it? And so um, there are devotees who just like say, well, we, you know, we don't need psychology and it's all secular bogus, this and that. But I mean, we all have psychology, so how can we say we don't need it? I mean, it's like you can't not need it, you have it. So you either have a healthy psychology or unhealthy psychology. So we need healthy psychology and we can get help uh, if we need. And the irony is a lot of people say we don't need psychology to have unhealthy psychology, which is why they say it. And I know that sounds offensive and it probably is, but at the same time, it's often true. As I have vast experience of going to temples to do my forgiveness course, and they say, oh, I'm so glad you're coming because so-and-so really needs this course. And I say, so-and-so is not coming to the course. Don't worry. The ones who really need it don't usually don't know they need it or don't admit they need it, so they don't come. That's my experience. So all I can say is, Hare Krishna. I mean, you know, as you all know, um, what do we call my classes? First, we call them Laugh Your Way Back to Godhead, but they're not that funny anymore. So we changed it to what? Get Real? Was that it? Is that what we called it? Get Sat? You know, and I, I feel in my old age, I have to tell you everything now because you're going to find out sooner or later. So I might as well just tell you before you find out. That way you can, you know, deal with it. You know, you can go home and cry after the class now, but it's better you cry without being abused than get abused and then cry. At least this way you can protect yourself, right? So I, I risk making offenses in telling what's true, but I feel that if it is true and it is beneficial, the offenses are, are not offenses then. They're just, it's just stating what is for your own benefit. Okay, so Kamala says, any Shastric reference that says we are allowed to serve unconditionally towards our Gurudev? Yeah, like 10,876. And that goes to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah, well, if the Guru doesn't try to interfere, then to Sri Krishna, yeah. No, Prabhupada said that's the general process. You offer to your Guru who offers to Prabhupada, who offers to his Guru, and up to disciplic succession, yeah. So that's the philosophy, yeah, it's everywhere. Without asking someone else permission all the time to get them to say, okay, you can serve. Okay, this is, um, oh, that's the second half of the question, which now puts me on the spot. Um, this is, this, I would like to answer this. Yeah, um, the answer is yes, but you have to deal practically because you serve, you may serve through authorities and so forth. And so if you, if you feel like your authority is, not in line with your spiritual authorities, then you have to discuss that with them or your spiritual authorities. Right? Mm. Our mood is only service to please our guru and Prabhupada. Pleasing your temple present is pleasing your guru. Or should we have our mood to serve in spontaneity and serve? But most times we are stopped from our service reaching good name. Uh, so I could just jump in, trying to understand. I need a, um, Kamala, if you're here, I need a practical example because I'm not clear because I may not be answering your question, but um, spontaneity um, depends what you mean by that. But, you know, we can't just do whatever we want whenever we want. I think maybe by spontaneity, you mean by in what you're inspired to do, you know, I'm inspired to do Mangalarti at 3.30. No, no, no. It starts at 4.30. And you're not a Brahmin. Wow. It's all rituals, you know, out with the rituals. I'm inspired. Let me on the altar. You know, obviously not like that, right? So, it, you know, inspiration can be, um, inspiration 
is not antagonistic to rules and regulations. It's just, you know, I'm, insp I'm inspired to drive on the wrong side of the street because I want my freedom and it'll make me feel good. Okay, but that's dangerous. I'm inspired to drive through red lights. I don't want to be restricted. Yeah, probably not a good idea. So, you know, there's a balance. Just, just be inspired to drive through green lights. That's fine, but not red lights. Yesterday, Satyarupa told me about the concept of landmine devotees who explode for no reason. <laughs> well, see, see what we're talking about, if we were to, you know, just kind of boil down, we're just saying that devotees are humans also. And, you know, any, any problems that we're facing aside from things beyond our control are problems of our humanness, of not getting along, not controlling ourselves, And so, we're we're devotees and that's glorious and that's our greatest qual qualification but we're also devotees in progress right we're pure devotees in progress and we're not there yet so we we may do something wrong we may make mistakes um i can i can use myself as an example in in regards to being a husband i i've learned a lot by doing it uh, especially um, by doing it, you see what works and what doesn't work. And so I'm quite clear on what doesn't work because I've done it and I've seen it didn't work. <coughs> People think I'm wise. No, it's just I did it. It didn't work. You know, I'm not wise. I'm stupid. I did it. When it comes to agree hostile life, I am wise only because I did all the wrong things. That's what made me wise. But I also learned the right things to do. And when I do the right things, I see that they work, right? So my humanness, my limitation, my lack of experience as a husband was not entirely improved by my chanting Hare Krishna. But at the same time, it was because I became humble enough to recognize my mistakes. So well, I'm not writing off being a devotee, not helping. But, but from my experience, it requires a willingness to improve. It requires learning how to improve. And so now that I'm a devotee and I've learned how to improve, I should be more humble about it, more willing to acknowledge my faults, apologize to my wife, try harder, etc. Because I'm a devotee, I know the importance of the Grihasta Ashram, so I work harder to, to make it work, etc. Right? So they work together, but to deny the human side of it, to me, is like you're wearing blindfolds. Like, who are you trying to kid? And if you're a leader and you do that, you're putting blindfolds on all the people following you, right? And it's very unhealthy for them because they're being trained to spiritual bypass. And so you have a whole community of spiritual bypassers. And when they are older and they realize that's what happened, they're not going to be happy about it. And they're not gonna, they're gonna have issues with their leader for doing that, I think. Well, if they're more gentle and kind, they'll understand. Well, he was a nice person, but he just didn't, he didn't understand. But some people, if that caused them big problems in their life, they're gonna be upset about it. And they're gonna have issues with that leader. Does that make sense? You know, so so you can't say, you know, you can't say, you know, like, well, Bhakti doesn't do anything to help you on the material level. Obviously, it does, but um, we have to qualify what it helps and how it helps and when it helps and what level, on what level you have to be on for it to help, and even it, uh, what it won't help no matter what level you're on, right? I mean, I use the example, I use, I use the example, which I think is, I don't say this is a criticism, it's just a, it's a case study. And Prabhupada talked about this a lot in his books. The difficulty that his god brothers had cooperating. Spiritually speaking, his god brothers were very, very elevated. There's no question about it. But they had difficulty cooperating. And there's no question about that either, because Prabhupada explained that explained it to us. It's, it's a history. And I always looked at that and I thought. This is really interesting. Very, very ele elevated devotees who you would think as they become more elevated would become more humble, wouldn't you? 
and therefore cooperation would be more natural, would be easier, or there wouldn't even be an issue. It would, it would just, there would only be cooperation, but there wasn't. So I think that example says a lot. And Rajabihari Prabhu gives a course that teaches us principles of conflict resolution. I'm actually taking the course now. So when he's giving the course, I was thinking, hmm, Gaudiya Math should have taken this course like in you know, 1932 or something, or 36, it would have helped. And, you know, and I'm taking the course and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, not seriously, but just playing with philosophy. Why do we need this course? We're devotees. Our philosophy is Trinata Pisumichena. So I think you've all probably thought about this. Our philosophy is be more humble than a blade of grass. So why are we having trouble cooperating? Why are we having a, we have a conflict resolution, what's it called? There's an office. Maybe it's a conflict resolution office. We have an office. If you have a conflict, you can get a mediator. Like, why do we need this? This is the Hare Krishna movement. Trinada P. Sunichina. We're practicing being more humble than a blade of grass, respecting everyone, not wanting respect. And conflict is all about not being humble and wanting respect and wanting to put down the other person. So it seems like, hmm, this is a paradox. So I think it just sheds light on the human nature of all of us. The high, elevated ones and the ones not so elevated, that that human nature, sometimes it needs to be tweaked through knowledge of these things, how to, how to resolve conflict, tweaked through knowledge and practice of how to be, how to be uh, more humble. I have a, a workshop on humility, which, which goes through a lot of what I would call tweaks on, on how to like instantly shock you into the next level of humility by asking you questions to reflect on and discuss. And it works. I see it works. Not like, not like you're going to become humble overnight, but it can make an effect. It can do something that could get you further along the path with more momentum to become more humble because ultimately it's bhakti that's going to do it. But sometimes you just need to get, you know, pushed in the proper direction and molded in a way that our philosophy can work better on you. Because we're seeing that for a lot of people who have issues, let's say, with cooperation and humility, it doesn't matter how many quotes they read where Prabhupada said cooperated, it doesn't change them. They don't cooperate. Because they're right. Why should I cooperate with you? I'm right and you're wrong. Conversation is over. Yeah. But what about Trinata PC and H? Yeah, you should be humble to me. That's what it means. Isn't it? What does Trinata PC and each chain mean? It means Christe should do whatever I tell her to do. That's what it means. I'm her guru. She's my disciple. She should be humble. Well, what about you, Guru Dave? You don't have to be humble? No, I'm the guru. You have to be humble. You're the disciple. A, if you want to live in a society like that, it's not going to work. So, of course, you can't change any leader, but at least you can, you can acknowledge there may be something wrong. So you better, with a leader you're dealing with, so you can deal with it better. And when you become a leader, you can practice Trinata Peace in each other, right? That makes sense? Yeah. Maybe we should change the title of this class, Leadership Training 101. I guess it's, I think we have to rename these classes because it's really misleading. It says Balaram. We didn't even talk about Balaram, the last two classes. Anyway, Tanya or Krishna, you may have to change the names of these classes. But Tanya says, oh my Govinda. And I was wondering why with some devotees, the conversation somehow always ends with ghost stories. So they're just bona fide devotees. Oh yeah, we're talking about, um, how do you know you're a bona fide devotee? Um, you talk about digestion a lot. You talk about ghost stories. And when you have to go to the toilet, you say, I have to service my body. Or if you want to be funny, you say, I have to do puja to my body. 
Sudya Rupa says, I have a friend who is just becoming a devotee. And she suddenly started speaking how Maya is so strong. I knew then she's really becoming a devotee. She got in touch with the Bhakti Viksha devotee. Oh yeah, so that's another qualification. When you become a devotee, you start, not only do you start talking about digestion, you start talking about how crazy your mind is and how strong Maya is. Yeah, we could do a little skit, you know, someone comes to the temple, they're all like successful materially and like, you know, bright and effulgent. Then they become a devotee. Prabhupada says, you become a devotee, you become bright and effulgent. This person becomes a devotee. Ah, oh, my mind, you know, I, uh, taking this ginger for my digestion, you know, <laughs> digest those pakoras and puris. <laughs> oh, look at that devotee in the black body. Look at that black body devotee, oh, it's so nice. Chrissy says, uh, this is from another class, I realize I would be a big mess without Guru Maharaj with all this stuff. I have been in my head. Reality check, Hare Krishna, from Pi. As Christy said, my life has changed since I started going to these classes a few months ago. So full of wisdom. I can't, how can I read this? It's like glorifying me. Okay, this is an announcement. This is an ad. I know I have so many things to deal with, and Maya is still strong. These classes help me always find the right path. I love spirituality, married psychology. They mix in a perfect blend. Yeah, I was a psychologist in my former life. Uh, one guru told her disciple, her 10-year-old daughter just passed away. He told her she was not really your daughter. Yeah, yeah we... we um, we see things like this very, you know, like, like the, um, this would be nice. This would be nice to write an article or a book on this, the paradoxes, like, you know, the empathic, compassionate devotee. When, when you shift into philosophy mode, you have to be careful because in philosophy mode, it can appear you lack compassion. I don't think this guru lacked compassion. He was trying to help her. But he's he's a he and she's a she. And I'm guessing probably he's a sannyasi who was never married. And maybe he never had any sisters. So that just doesn't understand. That's not exactly what a woman wants to hear when her daughter dies. Gurmash, my daughter just said, ah, what's the problem? You know, she wasn't your daughter. Get over it. You know, Hare Krishna. Talk to you later. You know. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, we've been talking about this amongst some devotees who, who, are, who are trying to bring more empathy into the conversation. Because philosophy can, can appear to be lacking in empathy. Prabhu, Prabhu, I just got an accident and a car ran me over. Prabhu, you're not the body. Come on, get over it. You know, like, okay, that's that's extreme, right? But I don't think I don't think it's any more extreme to say, you know, she's not the body. Your daughter wasn't the body. You know, she went back to Godhead. We should have a festival. Yeah. Um, I always find that you save those philosophical statements for like three months later, because then then they can hear them. Then they say, yeah, you know, she went back to Godhead. She's probably with Krishna now. That's good. But in that moment, we have to be more sensitive. Uh, this is subjective. Can we transcribe this class? Yeah, you can transcribe any class you think is worthy of transcribing. We can make a book. We transcribed a bunch of other classes once. We were supposed to make a book about it. What happened? What was, what was the topic of those classes? I forgot. So Bhakti Charaswami or something else? One year yeah. ago, it was about Bhakti Charaswami, one week of classes, actually. A little book about it or something? Or an article? Or... I will ask Satya Rupa. Yeah. Okay. I have like 108 projects. I, I can only, like, I only know like five of them. The other ones I forget. Okay. From Pai said, you said you are you. That's what I often tell people to say. They are searching for themselves. You don't need to search for something that's already there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they're trying to deny who they are because they don't like who they are. So, right, isn't it, Pai? 
I don't know who I am. Yeah, you do. You just don't like it. You don't like who you are. So that's why you're searching for a better self that isn't there, isn't it? Yeah. So you have to help them. Well, you know, you are who you are, whether you like it or not. So <laughs> you might as well learn to accept it. Yeah. You know? Right. What to do. All the girls in Sweden wish they had brown, brown hair and brown eyes. All the girls in India wish they had blue, blue eyes and blonde hair. So what to do? You are what you are. Get over it. You are what you are. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, he says, I notice that devotees are coming to KC to solve their material and emotional mental problems. And in most cases, KC won't solve those problems. Maybe even sometimes increases those problems. Ah, yeah. Is it not behind the criticizing there are unmet needs? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, every criticism is a need. There's a need behind every criticism. You know that, right, Tony? They teach you that in Psychology 101. There's a need. When you're criticizing, you're expressing a need or some frustration. Um, but this point, you know, it's true. Some psychological problems can exacerbate when you take to the spiritual path if you're not guided well, because they can play into your dysfunction, which is which is a little dangerous, you know. You're eccentric, you know. You think I'm eccentric now? Um, no, no, no. You know how would we say this? Um, you know. I'm eccentric now. Were you eccentric before you were a devotee? Yeah, but not so much. It's like Krishna Conscious gave me all the tools to be more eccentric. You know? um, were you fanatical before you were a devotee? Yeah, but I'm more fanatical now because I have things to actually be fanatical about, right? You know, before it was like, you know, you could be fanatical about politics or something, but, you know, we're fanatical about religion. Come on. That's, you know, way more. And way more of an emotional enterprise. So um, it's time to chant Hare Krishna. Think that's a good idea?